Welcome everyone to Crisis Conversations, live from the Better Life Lab. I'm Bridget Schulte, the director of the Better Life Lab, and I am so excited to welcome our panelists today and to all the participants who are here. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about a subject near and dear to probably all of our hearts, which is work-life balance. Is it even possible in a pandemic? Um, you know, but even before the pandemic, there have been surveys that have found that people think that work-life balance is a luxury. It's an impossibility that, you know, don't even, don't even bother talking about it. And yet, the research shows that work-life conflict leads to incredible stress, uh, to actually not doing very good work. It leads to ill health, things like uh, lack of sleep and insomnia and obesity and cardiovascular disease. And you know, not being able to have adequate time for work and adequate, adequate time for your life, it's really about the quality of your life. So we're gonna be talking today about this really exciting uh, project uh, that, that we've been very lucky to be a part of with Ideas42. Uh, and we've got Lynn Curran from Axion who's been part of the, the pilots for the project. So let me just uh, briefly introduce our guests and we'll dive right in. So we've got Matthew Darling. He's the vice president of Ideas42, which is a nonprofit design and consulting firm that uses insights from behavioral science to address complex social problems. He's also a teaching fellow in economic design at Harvard University. We've got Weehun Wee Wee Ung, sorry, Ung, who's a great friend and a senior associate at Ideas42. Sorry, Weehun. Uh, we've also got Antonia Volante. She's a senior associate at Ideas42. And as I mentioned, we've got Lynn Curran, who's the Senior Vice President for Human Resources at Axion, which is a global nonprofit committed to creating a financially inclusive world. So welcome everyone. And so Matt, I'd love to start with you. Um, you know, why behavioral science? You know, what we know about behavioral science is that it's all about nudges and creating choice architecture. And you wanna stick to your diet, so you put your fruits and vegetables where you can see them in your, you know, in, in your refrigerator. You wanna make sure people save for 401ks, then you make it a default rather than making them choose. So why behavioral science for a, something that I, I think you all even call a wicked problem, like work-life balance? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I'll say, you know, you know, obviously a lot of the work that's been done in behavioral science is around that sort of nudges, is about simple changes to context that you can make in order to change behavior. Um, but also it can, of course, all be applied to much more complex um, interventions or complex problems. And in this case particularly, you know, I think so much of the way we think about work is, you know, and, and so many other things is really almost like implicitly use this, this sort of classic economics rational actor model where people are going and they're making decisions based off of the best available information, they're maximizing their incentives, things like that. And when you think about that, you know, we, and we do a lot of work in that in terms of how people actually design policies and who they're designing it for. And when I think about the case of behavioral science with work life is that, you know, I can think in my own life, you know, before pandemic and of course right now after it uh, or during um, where I'd think about. Yeah, we how, hope it's after, but we're we not hope it's yet, after. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's not after for everybody. Um, but like thinking about the cases where I'm making a decisions about how I'm going to work and I'll say, OK, I'm going to, you know, I got a bunch of stuff done today, but not everything I want to do. So I'm going to get that done tomorrow. And it just stacks up and stacks up and stacks up. And I never really sort of do a good job of readjusting to the fact that I never quite meet my own expectations for how productive I'm going to be. Yeah, boy, that sounds and, familiar. Yeah. And, yeah. And every time I make a plan and say, okay, this is going to take me, you know, four or five hours to do. And then it takes 10 to 12 because there's just so much that happens on the sort of way of getting to A to B. Yeah. And so, you know, all those insights from behavioral economics, I think, can really be applied to how we think about work because so many times, you know, we're going out there, we're designing our own workforces or we're designing our, our work life for um, our fellow employees, and we make these sort of persistent mistakes in how we do it. And what we're hoping that we can do through this project and other work is try to make that better, make, make so we're saying, okay, we're designing the policies for the actual people who are going to have to live through it. You know, one thing that's really been so striking to me in this project is through behavioral science, learning about the power of the environment. 
you know, and the, you know, how you set up your environment can really lead you to even uh, to the choices that you make or um, even the choices you think you have. So Weehan, let me turn to you and, and talk more specifically about what this project, you know, talk, talk about what you actually have been doing and how you've been using sort of that, that idea of the power of environment to try to, you know, kind of shape cultures, uh, you know, so often we think, well, work-life balance, it's, it's all up to the individual. If you just made better decisions, if you were just more, if you just had more willpower, you know, it would be better. And I think one of the things that was so striking in, you know, in talking with you throughout this whole project is just how many patterns you found because of the environment. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about that and then about the actual work of the project? Yeah, so when we uh, started the project, we were really focused on trying to like decrease the instances where um, work-life conflict was happening. So moments where work was really clashing with other aspects of people's lives. Um, and basically when we were doing this research and trying to design solutions to help um, decrease those instances, we were just noticing, as you mentioned, Bridget, um, different subtle cues in our environment that lead us astray in one way or the other. Um, so for example, if uh, we were noticing just how, you know, different signals in our social environments, um, what who appears to be working later through, you know, subtle signals and emails or things from your boss, uh, subtle cues like that were shaping people's behavior to uh, maybe overestimate the degree other people were working mm. and subsequently drive them to think that they need to work more as well. And so we tried to, uh, and whether that was true or not. And so we were trying to pick up on those subtle environmental cues um, that drove people to maybe work a little bit more than they would have liked at times they would have rather not uh, yeah. and see if we can tweak it a little bit to, to, to minimize those instances. So if, so um, if, if I could just kind of jump in here. So what we know from the, from the data is that pre pandemic at any rate, that Americans worked really long hours, you know, you had sort of overwork long hours in sort of white collar fields. And you had a very different kind of overwork and kind of, uh, you know, lower wage jobs where you didn't have enough work. And so you would have to cobble together all sorts of different kind of unpredictable jobs that led to its own work life conflict and, and sort of long work hours. You know, so we've kind of got, you know, going back to the, the knowledge environment, we've got these overwork hours. And are you saying that some of it is because we are misinterpreting cues that we think other people, particularly people in power, are working more than they maybe are, and that's part of what's driving this overwork phenomenon? Uh, totally. I, I definitely wow. think that uh, part, of, uh, part of what's driving the overwork phenomenon is that, but there are obviously other drivers of this uh, challenge as well. So, you know, so talk a little bit more about what you, you know, kind of what you actually did in the, in the project. And, you know, not only talking about the, the power of the environment, but you, this really interesting concept of scarcity and how feeling kind of like you've got scarce time or scarce resources can also drive work-life conflict. Yeah. So for, for, the, uh, for the most uh, recent iteration of the project, we were really focused, we were partnering with other nonprofits to try to tackle some of the challenges that they were facing. So some of the challenges they were facing are kind of unique to them and recognizing we wanted to start somewhere and not we uh, boil the ocean, we ended up zeroing in on a few different uh, places where people were having some challenges. So uh, disconnecting on vacations, you know, trying to minimize the amount of time people are spending in meetings so they can actually do their solo work and log off for the day. Um, trying to think about how emails were kind of chasing people throughout all aspects of their lives and interrupting there. Um, and so we, we did a few interventions uh, to, to help people disconnect from emails um, and just remind them to kind of log off at the end of the day. And we'll get to that a little bit later. And also a few different um, uh, interventions or solutions to, to help people to remember to take vacation and take the take certain steps so they can really disconnect uh, before they hop into vacation rather than letting the work spill into it and mm -hmm. constantly be kind of checking in case something happened. Yeah, um, you, you know, just on that point, I don't, I, I can't tell you how many years it's been 
you know, that, you know, certainly that's been my personal experience. And you look at research and survey data, Americans, either they don't take vacation or they take work along with them when they do. Right. So, um, Antonia, can we go to you now and, and talk very specific, specifically about, you know, the work that you did with Lynn and Axion and Lynn, we're going to get to you in, in just a minute. Um, <laughs> But since we're still kind of like, you know, laying out the sort of the contours of the project, you know, what did you, um, you know, kind of what did you come up with for, for Axion? Yeah, I, I think that there's an anecdote that I want to share that I think lays the foundation well for what we did around vacation with Axion. So my dad has this principle that he uses that's foolproof for when you have like a housework that you need to do, like an ambient project, like washing the windows or steaming the carpet, something that like, you never need to get it done, but it's like lingering on your to-do list. And he calls this the party principle. And he says, if you have these things that you want to do when they build up, just plan a party, invite as many friends that you can think of for like a month later, and they will get done. He's like, I guarantee it. It will, it, it will get done before it. My mom hates the party principle, but like he swears by it. And so I think what we were doing with vacation at Axion was trying to find a way to use that party principle. Um, and so I can unpack that a little bit. So we learned when talking with employees and also looking at vacation data, where you're talking about Bridget, where there are a lot of people that were like, yeah, I would like to take vacation, but I just haven't. And when we dug into it a little more, it, it makes a lot of sense. Like going on vacation isn't just like you walk out the door, you're on vacation. You have to like think about what are your next week going to look like. You have to tell people you're going to be on vacation. You have to like make sure everything gets done while you're out. Like there's a lot of prep. It's kind of, and so it, it makes sense that it's like a thing that people want to do. It's like an ambient mm -hmm. thought, like washing the windows that you do want to take vacation, but it never feels urgent. Yeah. Um, and so then the more interesting question became, so like, then why do people take it? Like if it, if it takes work, it's never urgent. Like, you know, when are people actually leaving and taking time off? And, and that's when we realized like people tend to take vacation. Like it's almost like you take vacation as a consequence of something else that came up in yeah. your life. So like you're going on a trip with someone or you are going to a wedding. You know, we, when we talked to people, they kind of talked about their vacations around events that would happen. Um, mm -hmm. And in my own life, that's totally true. I mean, we literally call trips that we go on with other people vacations. Like we've almost yeah. thought about them interchangeably. They're sort of um, it's like a forcing function. So you don't actually go out and choose it. It's sort of like it happens to you. So you have to plan around it. So then you have mean? to plan around it. So yeah, that's what I'm kind of saying. It's like in behavioral science, we have these things that are barriers that are like features of the environment that Weehan was talking about that like inhibit you from doing what you want to do. And then there are channels that like get you to do what you want to do. And so it's almost like planning those trips and stuff. That's like a channel for you to do all that admin work. Um, and so what we were interested in figuring out is like, how do you create like a, a way to have that channel, like to give people like an arbitrary form of an event or something that they can like plan around so that they do all of those steps in the meantime. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, at Axion, they had been doing a thing with that I think a lot of companies do where they'd send email reminders being like, hey, Bridget, you have 10 days of vacation left. Um, your balance expires at this date, like reminder to take vacation. And so we use that as an opportunity to enhance it a little bit. And we had those emails sent out from a person on the HR team. And she also paired the email with a calendar invite. And so she put it on people's calendars for like a Friday or a Monday, two weeks from the day it was sent and mm -hmm. said, hey, this, um, hey, Bridget, um, I'm putting a, vac a tentative vacation day on your calendar. Um, use the time to go to a museum, like read a book, watch Netflix, um, and feel free to move it, you know, whatever works for you. And then really importantly, we copied their manager so that their manager was like aware and we already started the process. And now it's like a little socially accountable too. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I don't know, that's my thought of like the party principle of like creating that event for someone to, to like feel like, okay, yeah, this is something I've committed to. And then like all of those little tasks are, are easier to do. They can follow that after. You know, it's so interesting. There are, are other countries where people do not have such a hard time taking vacation. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if it's some of it goes back to the environment again, where in the United States we have these, you know, what, what sociologists and other researchers were called the ideal worker norm, that the mm -hmm. best workers are basically 
we're either in the office all the time or now in the pandemic online all the time. And so it's difficult since we tend to reward people who never go on vacation. I, mag I imagine that's part of the environment that makes it difficult to make that choice. Mm -hmm. so, so Lynn, let me go to you. What was Axion sort of experiencing when it came to work and work-life issues and health? Why did you want to get involved in this pilot project? And then, and then tell us, you know, kind of what, have, what did you learn as a result? Sure. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, it was it was really great and, and really exciting to be able to work with Ideas 42. Um, we had worked with them on some of our program side work in terms of behavioral economics on our financial inclusion work. Um, and they were actually the ones that that pointed us to this opportunity um, to work with them internal to the organization. And we have always really work life balance is, is really important to Exion. We have a culture where people travel all the time for work. Um, we work in different time zones, so people always, you know, are connected, which is why the other intervention we did was also around email. Um, but we felt like people weren't taking enough vacation. They were just, you know, this, the same thing that, that we heard from Antonia and we had that people just weren't taking the time. There's always so much work to do. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to do the other thing. Um, and so what we did was we identified people that hadn't taken time off in three months, I think it was, um, and did as, as Antonia said, we called it vacation roulette. Um, <laughs> and we just stuck a random day, a random Monday or, Monday or Friday on the person's calendar and said, you know, he, take this day off, read a book, watch a movie. You don't have to do anything with this day. It's just... Mm -hmm. Take a day for yourself um, and it was it was it was great we got some responses where people said i have a vacation planned next week or next month so thanks for the reminder i'm going to pass on this but really excited that you've reminded me my vacation is coming up um, and we had a couple of other people who might have moved the day and one person in particular who's a senior member of the of the organization got the email we copied the ceo and he, you know, the CEO was very good with his senior direct reports copy, you know, when he was copied, he replied saying, please take this day, you need time for yourself. Mm. And, you know, this one senior member, he was like, I'm going to take that day. Mm. Um, you know, and it was, it was really great to see, you know, it worked not at all levels of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and the piece about management is super important. I think that people don't always know when your managers are taking vacation or what your managers expect you to do in terms of vacation. Mm. And often your manager is expecting you to figure that out yourself. Oh. Um, you know, and so when we copied in the manager, it, it made a big difference. That's so interesting. Did it also matter that there were, like you, like you mentioned, that there were these messages of support, like this is okay to do. Mm -hmm. and they're not sort of violating the culture in a way by, by taking vacation. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I do want to go to email, but before we do, let's, let's really address the current moment because I know that this project has been going on for some time and, you know, sort of in a pre COVID environment, Lynn, let's stick with you. You know, uh, the world has totally changed. Work is completely disrupted in the last, you know, four or five months. People who can are working remotely. Essential workers are, are uh, out on the front lines. So many people are out of work. Um, how has, uh, how has the, the, this current COVID moment, how has that changed the way that you work? And then uh, how, how about these interventions? Can you take a vacation in the middle of a pandemic? I mean, yeah. uh, I, I speak for myself. It's something that I've certainly struggled with. You know, it's like, yeah. you just feel like, you know, there's just so much at stake that you can't afford to take this time off. And then, then you get like I did this week where you just hit a pandemic wall, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, I think the rain didn't help either, but you know, it's mm -hmm. really hard to function then. Uh, what are you finding with, with your, you know, Absolutely. in your company? And then uh, how do these interventions sort of translate? Absolutely. It's been, it's been really hard. You know, we, we thought we had a hard time getting people to take vacation before and work-life balance was so important to us when from one day to the next, there was no such thing as work-life balance. You know, you're, you're working surrounded by your family. You're, you know, you're taking care of your family, trying to pay attention to work. And so, you know, work-life balance kind of, you know, went out the window. And so we, 
really tried to work with staff and encourage staff, you know, if, if you need to work on Saturday because you need to homeschool your kid on Wednesday, do it, block it on your calendar so people know not to contact you on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And also if you're co-parenting and, you know, somebody, you have a little kid, somebody always needs to be with the kid, people started putting their, their spouses meeting on, the, on their calendar too, so they would know not to get time scheduled there. Vacation became more and more challenging and mm -hmm. we, you know, would encourage and encourage and encourage it and people would just put it off, put it off, put it off because where am I going to go? I can't travel. Um, and um, around June, I think it was, we put, we made a real push for it and we pushed our management team again to take, make sure they took vacation in July or August and make sure that they made that visible. Make mm -hmm. sure people know that you're taking vacation. If we can say every member of our senior management team has taken vacation during the pandemic, that's a big message to staff. Yeah. So we've been, we've been working on that. Um, I was speaking with one of our senior managers this morning who was supposed to be on vacation this week and uh -oh. was not, uh -oh. but he claims he's pushed it to next week. It's, so I'm making sure that nobody tries to contact him next week. Um, and we're thinking about how to use the vacation roulette again. Um, we're going to look at vacation balances through July. Mm -hmm. And based on that, we're, we're really considering doing it again because, you know, especially as it starts to get colder in the U.S., you know, it's okay again, to, if you're going to stay inside to watch a movie, to do this, to do that. So mm -hmm. we're definitely thinking that it's, it's something that, that we can turn to again. So can you, Linda, just um, ask the question, you know, again, in this country where we value productivity so much, why, why the focus on vacation? Why do you think that's important? And why, why was it so important to your, to your organization to actually come up with an intervention to, to encourage it? Well, I think it, it goes back to even what you said when, when you hit a pandemic wall, you know, and I've done that myself so many times that if I don't take a vacation by like, this time in August, I've hit a wall and I just sh shut, disappear for three days without notice. Um, and we wanted to avoid a little of that, <laughs> um, as well as avoiding the people that don't recognize when it's time to, to take a break and just keep going, going, going. And they get, as you know, we started it with people get sick, people get really worn out and burnt out. And then you start to, you know, the, the senior person that I was talking about, we had been worried about his health. Mm. Um, you know, over the past couple of years that mm -hmm. because he was working so hard, we had real concerns about his health. And so, you know, it was, it was a great example to see that that person is particularly worked for. Um, and so we, especially during the pandemic, you know, if people aren't taking a break, they're, they're not going to be able to function at the same level. If we're going to talk about productivity, you can't be as productive if you're that exhausted and that stressed out. Yeah. And so really convincing people to take the risk of taking a vacation and see how much better you feel. Yes, we know you'll get stressed when you get back, we know, but you will feel better than you feel right now. That's so amazing. You know, that you have to, you know, that we're the only country that I know of where we actually run commercials or ads encouraging people to take time <laughs> off and that was before the pandemic. You know, if I could go back to Wihan, I, we, we didn't have a chance to kind of fully talk more about the idea of scarcity, you know, and, and Matt, you know, uh, I'd love for you to chime in on this as well. You know, uh, one of the things that really struck me, you know, kind of what, what Lynn was saying is that they're really getting people to be very intentional about sharing their time and their calendar. And one of the other things that you said, Wihan, is that you found that email was chasing people through the day or that meetings, they were kind of like running every which way. And that does strike me when I talk to a lot of people and I do reporting about this, it's almost universal. You'll talk to people, they'll be like, I was busy all day long. I was running, emailing and, you know, going to meetings and then five or six o'clock hit when I should have ended the day. And I realized I hadn't done that one thing I needed to do, you know, and that that can drive so much of, of then work spilling over into the evenings and stealing from your life or spilling into weekends. And I am as guilty of that as anybody. Um, so Weehan, can you talk about the, you know, kind of like, again, those, those bigger patterns and how scarcity plays a role into that? Yeah, I think Lynn's notes on uh, why it's important uh, 
to take vacation actually plugs into kind of the scarcity conversation too, because um, taking a vacation, you, you just, in order to be innovative and creative and think big picture and longer term to see those things, you kind of have to uh, have a little bit of space to, to, to think about those things. You can't, uh, it's really hard to do that when you're zeroed in in the day to day and trying to churn through all those emails or, or just running from one meeting to the next, right? And so I think we started thinking about that scarcity frame after originally it was how do we keep these work from interrupting aspects of life? But what we kept hearing from people was, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough time. I can't think bigger picture. I, you know, get zeroed in and I tunnel in on these uh, immediate deadlines that I, I forget something important. And so we were just noticing that, you know, when people were feeling short on time, that they really zero in on the most immediate uh, tasks, which is helpful when you have a deadline. We, having a deadline sometimes helps us focus. Um, but when that's chronic, when all you can think about is your next meeting the next day, it really hurts uh, people's ability to do some long-term planning, which we also know is important, right? Mm -hmm. So, so what was the so what were what were some of the interventions that you that you were exploring around that? Like, how do you try to protect time to to think big or to do that important work so you don't feel like you're chasing your tail through the day? Yeah. Um, one of the things that we were really encouraging people to do were to, to set up, and this is for a certain, you know, professional context, we were encouraging people to set up um, blocks on their calendar to just do that longer term thinking, do that uh, bigger picture thinking, and to really take stock of what they're doing. Because what we found is that without those blocks on people's calendars, people would uh, have others schedule into them which crowded out any time that they, they, they had to really think bigger picture. But I think that, again, is in kind of the, um, in a certain kind of work context. And I think thinking even bigger picture than that, I, I, I think the uh, encouraging people to actually have time off, right? And mm -hmm. even encouraging people um, for, for other sorts of workers who might be doing shift work, uh, giving them some, uh, some folks are getting uh, notice for when they have to work, you know, just a day of or a couple of days before. And that really um, throws people's ability to to kind of think longer term and plan longer term as well. And so I think just uh, a little bit bigger picture, just trying to figure out when is uh, kind of that scarcity situation important because it helps us focus, but when is it less helpful because maybe we've gone a little bit too far and we need people to give people time to think bigger picture, be creative, be innovative, and also just um, take care of other things in their life so they don't uh, intrude and uh, take occupy mental space when, when they are on the job. Yeah. So Matt, like, you know, to pick up on, on something that Weehan said, you know, um, that a lot of this work was done sort of in the knowledge worker or the professional work setting. How could this translate to say the essential workers or mm -hmm. hourly workers? Um, you know, what, what could sort of translate into that? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing is, and this occurred to me when Lynn was talking as well, you know, one of the things we worked so hard on was how do you get the workers to sort of represent what they're looking for to management and how does management sort of represent what, what they're comfortable with to workers. And what was sort of really interesting a lot of time is, is how often there's sort of people misrepresenting that, you know, in either direction, right? So management who is thinking like, oh, we've really communicated to everyone that you can take vacation and that it's not a problem. But at the same time, when someone takes vacation, you might just grumble a little bit in that mm. moment. And, you yeah. know, that, you know, that's, that, that's one thing with like the knowledge workers, but I think it's something that's really sort of generally applicable. Um, you know, one thing that I've been seeing so much of and thinking about a lot during this time is, you know, reading about people, you know, trying to think about their working um, conditions, right? Mm -hmm. So that could be um, nurses who don't have enough PPE. It could be right. people at the grocery store who are, are not, you know, confident that they're putting measures in place. It can be teachers who are saying, hey, we really don't feel comfortable opening schools right now. Um, and, you know, obviously some of this is about economic power. A lot of it is, um, I'm not saying there's no bad actors in this sort of world, but I think a lot of it is, is like, how do you actually 
you know, convey your mindset and convey your need to other people in your organization, to other people you're working with? And how do you actually get them to act on that? How do you go and say, you know, hey, these are the things that we want out of this workplace. Um, and, you know, one thing I keep on thinking about, you know, with especially essential workers is that they're the experts in the production processes that they're in, you know, that, mm -hmm. that they're the ones who say, hey, this is how I interact with our customers. These are how I interact with our other staff. And because of that, they're usually the people who are sort of best placed to actually understand how to, how to change things to make them more safe. Mm -hmm. And it's not clear to me that, you know, those needs and the, that understanding, that information is going to be heard by um, the management. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm thinking about locally owned places that I know that, you know, have basically said, hey, we're not reopening, but we've until now, and we've actually completely like torn up the entire interior of it and everything's like a glass, you know, but there's glass between you and the customers. And then you other see other places where they're like, oh, we've installed these like shirt, you know, shower curtain rods between you. And you're like, well, that's a, that's a big difference in how, how you're being attentive to, to people and what their needs are. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, we're, we're coming down on time. So what I would like to do, um, Antonio, if we could go back to you, um, Lynn, uh, bring you back in you know, kind of final thoughts, you know, here we are in this pandemic, you've gone through this experience, you know, what should listeners, you know, what can they, you know, what can they learn from this? What can they begin to do themselves to uh, survive through this, through this period, but potentially to, to thrive when we, when we go back to whenever new normal uh, becomes our new normal. Antonio, <laughs> you want to start? Yeah, I mean, it's a big question, but I think if there's one thing to take away, it's that, um, behavioral science just like provides a framework for thinking about how your situations that you're working in, they aren't always set up for you to do what you want to do and what's healthy to you, mm -hmm. but they are going to influence your behavior. And so it, it's important to try to be, figure out like, what, what do you want to do? You know, like come up with like, check in with yourself. Like, do I want to take more vacation? Do I want to stop emailing late and try to think about what what here about like the way my situation is is like preventing me or making it harder for me to do that like do do i need to just like plan um i don't know some sort of go to a virtual museum on two saturdays from two fridays from now to get me to go on vacation um just think about how you can like nudge yourself to do certain things because mm -hmm. we can't we can um expect our world to just be designed for us to take work-life balance unfortunately right now that's just not the case Lynn, final thoughts? We'll give you the last word. Oh, no pressure. Um, <laughs> well, I think, you know, again, this was a really great experience. And I think, you know, some of the key takeaways have already been mentioned. And I think the, the importance of, of recognizing what signals management is sending to staff and what signals staff is really looking for. I think that was a, a key takeaway um, from the two interventions that we did. One, we copied managers and one we didn't. And without even trying, we had a control group and, <laughs> and the test group. And we saw that copying managers and involving managers really made a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and as always, the importance of, of taking a vacation. Um, one other piece that Antonia mentioned was so many companies send out the, you have 10 days vacation and you're going to lose them. This is the day you're going to lose them. Um, and one thing we realized was that was pretty much all we were saying in the message. Mm -hmm. And with the help of Ideas 42, it was, it, you know, it, we just had never even thought about it just to reword that so that it's saying, encouraging you to take that and the benefits of vacation and, you mm -hmm. know, being a little bit more friendly about it all, um, you know, made, made, also made a big difference. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being part of this conversation today. I want to thank all of our guests. I want to thank the participants. We had some, uh, some lively chat, and so uh, we'll be following up online. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions. Uh, thank you so much to the New America events team, the Better Life Lab team, to David Schulman, our producer. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about, so you've hung out your Black Lives Matter sign. How do you build an anti-racist organization? We'll have folks from the Army, and project inclusion from Google, the head of DEI, and some other really great guests. So in the meantime, wash your hands, wear a mask, think about how you design your environment to help you make better choices, and uh, we'll see you next week.